uh, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for having us here and uh, the opportunity to share, you know, some updates on um, the market and the region, and how you know it's developing through the crisis and then coming out of the crisis. So we wanted to ground us in some facts here on the um, basically the impact of the crisis and the speed of the recovery. And so comparing a few regions here um, globally, North America, U.S., Europe, and Asia Pacific and China, I think it's interesting to see that until the summer in July, domestic Chinese demand was very well on track towards recovery, but other regions developing very, very differently. So if you look at the global um, picture on the very left-hand side, you see that um, We've seen, a, we've seen a recovery in almost, almost system-wide international travel, domestic travel. Um, if you compare that against uh, across regions, you look at Asia Pacific and China as an example, the domestic traffic has been recovering much faster than any other segment and also on a slightly you know, steeper slope. Um, in North America, for example, domestic has also recovered, but still the gap with others is, is just not as big as in other regions. So we've been looking at China as a bit of a leading indicator for air travel demand. And I think quite interesting to see here how strong the, you know, um, recovery was for domestic. And in some cases, it was even back to pre-crisis level in, you know, for China domestic travel. And there were a few days in August where it was actually exceeding last year's volume. So at least some signs of, you know, positive momentum um, for air travel. If we look at, um, you know, the U.S. more specifically, we're looking at um, bookings for flights and bookings for hotels. So for flights, the domestic travel bookings have really not made up for, for a level seen pre-crisis. But what I find quite interesting is that the hotel bookings have recovered in a similar, similar pattern, but slightly stronger than flights. I think that is just an indication that we're actually seeing a bit of a modal shift where people prefer taking the car um, and driving to the destination and staying in a hotel there. So we've seen a little bit of decoupling in the U.S. domestic market, but a general sort of pattern that is very similar ac across flights as well as hotels. Now, looking at um, purchase criteria, and some of um, the previous presenters have already hinted at that here, we have done some research together with um, Trivago, a hotel booking platform, to see how has traffic developed uh, over the last couple of months. And what I find really interesting is that the non-price factors have become much more important in travel decisions. So on the left-hand side, you see the share of sorting criteria on the booking platform for bookings made out of the United States. The red line is the, the um, is, is basically price as a sorting criteria, and then you see relevance and distance as the sort of green line and, and gray line. And interestingly, price, the importance of price has decreased on a relative level, but people have much more frequently sorted based on distance to make sure, you know, um, maybe it's more attractive or feasible to travel to a destination that is closer by because I can actually take the car or it feels like I have more flexibility to go back home earlier or without being um, sort of attached to a travel booking. And then relevance is also quite interesting. People had much more specific booking requests when entering into the search, search engine, essentially. And so much more frequently sorted for relevance than, actual, than price. On the right-hand side, you see the development of the prices that were displayed on the platform and then the prices that people actually I find it quite interesting that the development overall has roughly been the same versus last year. The difference between the offered price that is displayed and the willingness to pay, so the price people actually click on, was very, very similar. I would like to note, though, that the development of the prices this year was much more spiky with greater differences and changes compared to last year. And I think that is just an indication that there was such a difference in uh, locations or destinations that were high in demand versus others that weren't that interested, interesting anymore. And, you know, hotel companies have, have obviously also adjusted their prices um, depending on demand. Now, I wanted to take a step back also and look at the bigger picture here. Now, this is an industry that has been tied to 
you know, a lot of other sectors um, in the economy, transportation, flights, express logistics, uh, and we're there, it's building up. <laughs> Perfect. So we wanted to share a bit of a picture across areas for transportation since, you know, we're living in an ecosystem. It's not only about flights. There's typically also hotels attached to it um, and other modes of transportation. And if we look again at China, it's quite interesting to see that in China, the uh, logistics volumes, um, international flight volumes or, you know, uh, metro stays have been have recovered much, much faster than in other places. Um, international flights and cruises are still very much at a low end, has not really recovered, but domestic transportation, metro, subways, etc., have actually recovered to almost greater than, um, you know, crisis levels. I just want to point out express shipments, and I think that's the trend that we're seeing in almost all geographies. People are buying more online, whether it's Amazon or any other shopping platform, and that has resulted into much stronger growth and express volumes, um, very much decoupled from any other areas that are touching our ecosystem. Now, closing off, um, the question really is how can we recover and how can we um, tackle innovation and at the same time be very conscious about cost and the development of the market and the size and I think across the board, we're seeing four different areas that travel companies uh, should now pursue to find a way throughout the crisis. Uh, we heard it from many, many of the previous speakers. It's listening to the customers, but not only listening to understand what their needs are and, and you know, what their anxiety is and what, you know, um, uncertainty to address in communication, but really just to understand the different needs. And here we're seeing a lot of travel companies looking towards a micro-segmentation view so not only personalization, but actually understanding groups of people that are similar and how do I need to address and talk to them and provide different offers. Then we heard a lot about innovation, making the travel journey and experience better, not just safer. And I think that's a really high bar that is quite exciting to use the momentum at the moment uh, to make the journey better, address the pain points, um, not only during COVID, but also the ones that we had before. I think thirdly, also very important, I think we're all realizing we need to expand our horizons and build partnerships across the value chain, across the ecosystem to build confidence and build processes and journeys that actually work and that are actually feasible. It's, a great, it's, it's great to watch the industry and see how much collaboration we're seeing across the system. And then I think last but not least, um, it's you know, staying nimble, I think every travel company I've been talking to in the crisis was very proud and happy about the speed and agility and decision making and the core functions and the day to day execution. And I think everyone's wildly agreeing that that should stay. So that is important to keep in mind, not only in the long term, but also to work through the recovery. Thank you so much, everyone. And back to you, Beth.